properties were sold with protective covenants and a rehabilitation agreement. Anne was the very first person to buy a house to restore in Glencoe. She is an avid researcher, enthusiast, and teacher who loves to share stories about the mill way of life. Tonight she will be talking on Voices of Women in the Southern Cotton Mills. Please welcome Anne Hobgood. There'll be some pictures running just of uh, various uh, scenes from some from Glencoe and just some general scenes of women in cotton mills. Um, unlike um, a lot of people who either write about mill villages or research them or uh, paint pictures of them, I have absolutely no background uh, in, in textiles or cotton mills. I've never seen a cotton mill. I didn't know anybody that ever worked in one. And I only came into this um, by means of real estate. So <laughs> looking for another old house to restore, um, I saw the Preservation North Carolina site in 1999. And uh, my children were looking for a historic home. And I went out and they said drive to Burlington. I had never been there. Um, and when I turned the corner into Glencoe off of Highway 62, I was just astonished. I felt like I had driven onto a movie set. Um, there are two full streets, 40 some houses, abandoned in 1954, missing windows, porches laying on the ground, trash in the front yard. Um, and somewhere in here you'll see one of the pictures. Uh, it is my house uh, before. And I just fell in love with it. And I put my money down on the house the very same day. I picked out the one I wanted, said, here's my money, hold it for me. And um, my children ended up not buying a house there, <laughs> but I did. Um, and within a year, I moved in, lived there for two years without any other residents of Glencoe, which is an interesting experience and uh, sort of feeling like you have an entire old mill village with uh, falling down buildings around you, but I loved it. And began to feel a real closeness and kinship to a way of life that I knew nothing about. So I read everything I could get my hands on, I uh, sat on my front porch a lot so that people would stop and talk to me, people who drove by just to check on the way it used to be, uh, some of whom were not too happy about our, uh, fixing up everything, making it look all fancy, um, but most who were just thrilled that we were just in the nick of time to save a village that probably would have very soon um, been completely lost. And just a little, little uh, back note, the, uh, the reason it was still there and the reason it's so unique is that it, being abandoned in 54, many mill villages were abandoned, mill, mills closed. But in this case, there were two owners and they could not agree on what to do with the property. So they disagreed so greatly, one to save, historically one to uh, sell them off or tear them down or um, that these one owner uh, waited for the death of the other one and that's how preservation got it in 1997. Um, just a little about Glencoe, uh, it was built in 1880 and it was a cotton mill that wove uh, the famous Alamance plaids. It wore my plaid jacket but it's not Alamance plaids. <laughs> um, and it was the last water-powered mill on the Hall River, built by the Holt family. And um, they, they um, performed very, very well, uh, selling most of their products in, in the New York City area. Um, but for various reasons, one being that the napped plaids, the flannel shirt look was what most of the fabrics looked like um, as that became less the fad and that they did not update their equipment than Glencoe fell as many, as many uh, mills did in, in the mid-century. Um, I just feel real connected, I, I guess because I happen to know that my house, there was, uh, it was run pretty uh, strong-handedly by the matriarch of the family. They, they ran a boarding house, and so it was the, the minister lived in the house at, at, at one time, but his family uh, ran a boarding house. Uh, so many men rented 
uh, beds, actually. They didn't rent rooms, but rented beds there. But there were also uh, girls in the family whom I've just come to know of by uh, asking people who are still alive. But I've just felt a real connection with that. And I've read every book I could get my hands on on cotton mills and decided when Julie asked me to talk, I said, what do you want me to talk about? She said I could pick. So I thought the idea of women's voices um, would be very interesting in, of, of the southern cotton mills. So I went through and just oral histories that I have in various books and picked out a few that I thought you might be interested in hearing about. Uh, women, when the, the rise of cotton mills, and I think more about North Carolina than the whole southeast, but the rise of cotton mills after the Civil War, um, well, wealthy white mill owners were looking for women and children to work in their mills because they could hire them cheaper than men. And prior to 1900, about three quarters of the workforce was women and children. And if you think about these people, at least in Glencoe, most of these people coming either out of the mountains, as you talked about, or off of farms or both, uh, into what they call public work, it must have been a real shock to go from the more, um, uh, the life that they, that they knew and controlled somewhat to the paternalistic system of being controlled by a mill owner and jumping when the, when the whistle blew. Um, but the other side of that, the flip side of that would be, this is the first time that women really would have had daily contact with other women. And so there really was were positive, positive sides to this too. Um, in their uh, desire to be collaborative um, and mutual, uh, mutuality and, and, and being able to support each other in various aspects, including things such as um, taking over the roles of doctors because a lot of the villages didn't have doctors and so the nursing and doctor roles fell to women of the village. Um, advocating for village schools. Every mill village didn't have a school and they wanted their children to have education. Um, raising other people's children. There were many reasons why there were children who didn't have parents who, who could raise them and that was a common thing to take in other people's children. And being collaborative in their sustenance, raising gardens, helping to cook together, sharing their food. In addition, they like to have a lot of fun, so I'm going to read you a few things. Uh, they, they enjoyed a good, a good joke, a good prank, um, sharing conversations, and developing that front porch culture that uh, we in Glencoe have hoped that we might be able to return to. I spend a fair amount of time reading on my front porch and talking to anybody who wants to walk by. And then in addition, that, that coming together of women empowered them to eventually have a public voice. Because women historically had not. They didn't get the vote until 1920. They, it was white men that generally would be writing to their congressman or contacting their president or whoever uh, if they had issues. But uh, in the later years, I'll read you a couple of things of where women felt empowered to uh, have a public voice, whether that was in protesting or in uh, trying to get help from, from uh, politicians. So although cotton mill workers have been often been portrayed as just passive victims of the industrial system, um, when you actually talk individually, uh, many of them describe how they were able to create their own world, um, emphasizing that cooperation and mutuality. Um, and one thing that brought them together was the, the fact that they were able to converse with each other during the, their work day. And Eva Hopkins, who worked in the Charlotte Mills in the 30s, um, She said, you worked on the frame with somebody, you could talk through it, you could see through it, you worked in the alley, there was a lady in the alley with you, and then there was one on the other side of the frame. Well, that, there was that too that you could talk to. We talked about how bad we hated to work, and how tired we were, and how little bit we were getting paid, and we wished that we were somewhere else, doing something else. There were a few younger girls that worked up there, and we would talk about our dates and the parties we went to. Mill life uh, was certainly hard for women, and they never had equal pay. Um, 
to men or equal opportunities for advancement. Arlene Walzer was a um, spooler in the, in the Thomasville mill. And she says, there were men all around me doing jobs that were easier than what I was doing, and they were making more money. That bothered me. My husband was a boss man out there for a good long while, but I don't care if he was. When Christmas time came around, the men got big bonuses, and we women might get a little one. I just didn't think that was fair. We had to work as hard as the men. Harder. They were sitting on their rears writing down numbers. They said it was brain work, and I said, what brain? <laughs> yeah, I know I was working hard. Some of them were afraid to say anything, though. See, they were scared they would lose their jobs, I reckon, and they probably would have. Milk people take a lot, but you'll find one or two that's not like that. They put me working with this man one time, and he'd come in of a morning, and maybe he'd be a little grouchy. I'd say, now listen here, I feel bad too, so get, off, get your butt off your shoulders. That's what I'd tell him, and he'd start laughing at me. And although women's earnings were, were meager, they were still able to be somewhat economically independent for the first time, and even purchase some non-necessities. Annie Freeze, who was a spinner in High Point, tells this story. She says, I remember I made $12 a week, and I went and bought a living room suit. We never had a living room suit in our house, and I went up to Huffton's up there in town and bought our first living room suit. I paid $1 a payday on it. That made the payments. If I had to be out because work got slack, I paid 50 cents to make my payments until I got that thing paid for. It was covered in that blue velvet. A blue velvet thing, and oh, I was so proud. I fixed that thing up there in front of the fireplace, and Mama was as proud of it as I was. She'd have prayer meetings and had the preacher over to see that beautiful living room suit. I'm not kidding. I'm not stretching it. The Lord knows it's the truth. They also, the girls and women love to tease and uh, play tricks. One some of you may have heard because it's been done several times in plays, but Edna Hargett, who was um, a weaver in Charlotte, uh, tells a story about uh, dipping snuff. About everybody in the mill used snuff. Well, I had a box overturned there, and I'd keep my snuff can down under it. There was a weaver in there who'd always use my snuff. She wouldn't buy snuff. She'd use my snuff. Several other weavers told me about it, and I tried to catch her with it. I told her a time or two that somebody was getting my snuff, but she seemed to, didn't seem to pay any attention to it. So I went and got me some cayenne pepper, <laughs> and I poured it in. So whenever she went over there and got some of my snuff, it burned her mouth. She couldn't work. Being her mouth got so burning, she had to go home. She lost three days of work, but she never did steal no more. <laughs> <laughs> mentioned that there, a lot of people raised other people's children and one of the people that are on this slideshow I think it's one of the only two color pictures is somebody that I have uh, come to know her family and uh, she was known in Glencoe uh, for taking in other people's children um, um, another another um, Glencoe resident Ethel Fawcett uh, tells this story about taking in somebody else's child it wasn't nothing unusual for mill families to adopt orphan children, even in the absence of blood ties. My own parents adopted a five-year-old girl named Kate whose mother died unexpectedly. My mother and Kate's mother were just good friends. They weren't a bit of kin in the world. They were just good friends. When Kate's mother fell ill, my parents stayed with her till she died. And Kate went out on the porch and told Daddy she always called him Uncle Man. She says, Uncle Man, I ain't got nobody. Mama's gone. I want to come and stay with you. 
Daddy said, I got eight of my own, but one more won't make no difference. Just come on when you get ready. When men came from the children's home from Elon, they came to claim Kate. We refused to give her up. Mama told them, I got eight of my own, but I'm...